We had some more exciting chess in round two of the candidates tournament in Yekaterinburg. I'm going to take you through the game between Fabiano Caruana and Kirill Alexienko. Remember, don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe. And if you want to support the channel, we'd be really grateful. Do check out the links to Patreon and also PayPal. Remember, so if you subscribe to Patreon, there are free vids, newsletters. Do check it out. OK, here we go. Caruana with the part white pieces. And it's clear that he really wanted to target Alexienko. He's clearly the weakest player in the tournament. And I, I think, you know, with the white pieces, this is a chance for Caruana. And so we see, well, first of all, Caruana allowing a Nimzo and playing one of the sharpest lines with F3, which can lead to really wild positions. Well, as Fabi said after the game, it's a fighting line and also, but also very risky for white. The line he plays is extremely decent for black and it was probably a bit hazy in his memory. Mine too. So yes, both players were a little bit at sea. Now, this is a very respectable way for black to play here. And you give up the centre. I mean, at first glance, this just looks fantastic for white. But here, well, e5 is the most popular continuation uh, to, to break up white's pawn front. Um, well, you might recall a game between Nakamura and Carlsen from a few years ago in Zurich that went d5. Um, and Carlsen eventually won, but he was very lucky. Um, instead, Alexienko played c5. So that pawn has to push on, otherwise it just breaks up. Well, you can also play e5. This was actually played by Firuz Ja in uh, the Tata Steel tournament. But should be okay for um well for black uh, both cards are all right d5 holds more tension in the position actually so that is a big pass pawn on d5 protected but it's hard to go anywhere and now bishop e2 so both sides developing and the bishop comes out before the knight so that's pretty regular uh, we've seen sorry just going back one move we've seen bishop d6 played a couple of times in the past but i don't see what's wrong with simply attacking that bishop straight away with knight b5 so i think knight d7 is a better move now this this is already a very tense position you know there's there's imbalance so obviously the pawn on d5 is white's big asset. The big drawback of white's position is the lack of an f-pawn, which means that these squares along the e-file are a bit weaker. So, you know, you would like, for example, to have a pawn here and to be able to play bishop e3, just to kind of close things. But it's permanently open. And squares like e4 are also available potentially later on for black's pieces. So I think white has to be careful here. And, and of course, there's another drawback, having no f-pawn. The king only has two pawns in front as cover. So this is very double-edged. And Caruana's next move really kind of cranks things up another notch as well because he pushed forward with d6 obviously forcing the bishop back but this raises the stakes the d-pawn is very disruptive for black on the other hand it's now moved away from its safe mooring on d5 and that pawn as well as being a strength could potentially 
turn it into a liability because it's no longer protected by another pawn. So this is really tricky. Pawn to h3, of course, black doesn't want to give up that bishop, which would leave white's light squared bishop very powerfully placed. And now knight b5. I think if you play the pawn to d6, then you have to charge on. You have to maintain the initiative. So this knight simply wants to hop in on c7. Now, Alexeyanko had a very big think here, thought for, I think it was something like, well, I've got, it says 36 minutes written here, but I, again, I don't know whether that's accurate, but it was, a, he invested a lot of time and, and rightly so, because it is a very sharp position, but perhaps he played a move which wasn't the best. Rook b8 looks kind of normal, but he must have been concerned about knight c7. But then black has a couple of interesting options. One is to give up the exchange like this. Uh, you can see that, well, that obviously the knight will, will have to retreat Oops, to, to, to one of these squares. White is actually a little bit behind in development. And, you know, don't forget, you know, that bishop looks pretty good here. And there's also rook e4 as well. And again, it's another way of giving up the exchange. It's not clear to me which is better, but black definitely has compensation there. You can see these squares are weak. But Alexionka played rook e6, which keeps tabs on the d-pawn, but... Um, Bishop f4 is a good move. Just holding on to that pawn and, you know, giving the king a bit of protection as well along that diagonal. a6. So the knight is pushed in. Um, Fabi said he thought this idea was quite clever, actually. So he's basically gained a tempo. The bishop came out to f4, that's good news. But black has put the rook on e4 with tempo. Um, and if the rook in the corner is taken, then, well, black definitely has compensation here. That pawn is going to drop. And maybe another, another pawn is in the bag as well. Now, Fabi dropped the bishop to h2, he could have played queen d2 as well, but bishop to h2 is okay. So now this is a threat. So rook c8. Now it is absolutely essential for white to maintain some kind of initiative here, otherwise that pawn could simply drop. We can take here, play rook d4, and then this one goes, the knight's in trouble, and so on. You have to play really aggressively. G4. Now, if that bishop drops to G6, then the rook is in trouble. So this pawn has been secured. And then you could play queen D2, and then perhaps bishop D3, or even bishop D3 immediately. And white should be better there. You can see this is... It's another octopus position. <laughs> this this knight, okay, normally it would be on d6, but it's a pretty good octopus on c7 because it controls so many key squares. Central conditions for an octopus should be stationed right in the heart of your opponent's territory. And it basically stymies and controls so many important squares, making it very difficult for black's major pieces to operate. So I think we can we can still call it an octopus. So after g4, Lexienko plate bishop takes g4, giving up a piece. And this is very unclear. Now I mentioned earlier how the problem is that White's king only had two pawns in front. Now those two pawns have gone. But Fabi is a piece up. But here is where, I mean, with white, 
you know, one false move and your position can just collapse. So for example, I mean, the move you would like to play is to connect the rooks with queen d2, but watch what happens. Knight takes bishop. And if knight takes, bishop takes here, and queen g5 check is threatened, and queen g2, also queen takes knight, and suddenly, well, black is going to be three pawns up. Disaster. So coming back here, Caruana has to play precisely. Now he played bishop d3. That rook is in trouble. So if rook e3, then bishop f4 wins the rook. Well, or yeah, you'd still have to be very careful taking it, but looks like white has things under control. So after bishop d3, knight takes bishop on h2. The rook was taken and knight takes rook, queen takes so at the moment, white is still a piece up, but black has two pawns. Now, Leksienkov took on d6, so it's three pawns. But in fact, taking there is a mistake. It would have been better to play knight f6. And after the game, Caruana said he thought this was the only chance to survive. Now, the knight attacks the bishop. And Caruana thought his best was to play rook e1. The knight manages to get back to this lovely square d5. But this isn't so clear. It's three pawns against a piece. Um, I mean, b5 is possible just to try to exchange off more pawns, undermine the knight on d5. You can also check first. This is what Fabi thought. And then b5, perhaps trade some pawns. White stands better here, but it is finely balanced. And if white gets it wrong, then you know he could. Well, I, I mean, I don't think white is in danger of losing, but certainly, you know, black has decent drawing chances. But instead of knight f6, Alexienko, who was running short of time actually, took here. But now that the knight comes back to, to d5 cleanly, you could say, this is a completely different situation. Suddenly there are loads of tricks. For example, if knight f6 here, then that can be taken and queen h3 attacking h7. And the rook absolutely fatal for black. And there are similar tricks with knight e5. And if here queen takes queen h3 once again hitting that loose rook and h7. So after knight e5, g6. But now, well, I think Caruana played it excellently. He realized that he suddenly got a huge attack. I mean, that knight on d5 plays a very important role, of course. I mean, it really dominates black's pieces. And it's very difficult for black's pieces to switch over to the defense. And this is a very straightforward attack. Put the king in the corner. And this is a confident move. Fabi leaves that knight on e5, but simply sends this knight into the attack. And soon there are going to be opportunities to either sacrifice on g6 or play knight f5. Um, my computer thinks that rook c6 is the best defensive move here. It looks like an awful move to me. I mean, it's such an inhuman move. Um, I mean, I guess there are perhaps chances to defend along here, but it still looks pretty rotten. I mean, particularly when you put it on the same line as the bishop. h5 was played. Of course, he's hoping to station the knight on g4, which would shut out 
white pieces, but I'm afraid that isn't going to cut it. For example, we're here, Lexienka played bishop f8. If knight g4, then this is such a strong move. If pawn takes, bishop takes, he's just going to take here and just blast through to the king. And you can see because that knight is on d5, it's going to stop black's king running away. After knight f5, here's a nice variation, which uh, Fabi demonstrated after the game, actually. And now queen h6, threatening mate. And if pawn takes, well, that's the ABCs of attacking chess. Bishop here, uh, followed by the classic discovered check and checkmate. Or simply queen h7 and queen h8 mate is threatened because, as I mentioned, the knight covers the e7 square. And if bishop f8, we've got a nice check here. Which wins the queen? That's good enough. So coming back here, rook g1 has just been played. Bishop f8. I mean, there are a few ways to win. Knight takes g6 already wins. But knight f4, well... Every single one of white's pieces is joining the party, and it's going to be quite a party on the king's side any moment. And this is just a case of sheer weight of numbers destroying the pawn front in, in front of black's king. Simple stuff, attacking the knight. Bishop takes... And we're almost at the end of the game. Obviously, if the king retreats, it's going to be mate. Um, I mean, this is in vain. Of course, it's possible to go into an end game, And this is an extra piece. But well, Fabi just realised he can finish this game immediately. And in fact, after his move, queen h5, Lexienka resigned. Um, let's just see why exactly rook takes bishop is threatened with an extra piece and a checkmating attack um if queen f6 well white is a piece up here with a superb initiative and black is not going to survive after this well let's just take you through a a possible variation. I mean, there are a few variations, but it's quite clear that so long as white avoids landing in perpetual check, which you can do very easily, then it's dead simple. Um, and this is threatened, and well, you know, everything is threatened here, basically. Let's let's go to mate uh, here and here. And one more variation after queen h5, if the bishop is protected with this, then we can deliver checkmate. And that's a sweet move because it covers the knight on f5. And after king e6, rook e1 forces checkmate. Well, I thought that was a very confident performance from Fabiano Caruana. He played quickly. It was his opponent who was in time pressure. He played quickly and confidently. He calculated accurately, he sensed when the critical moment was in the game and crunched it through in his mind. Um, he took a risk in the opening, played something very sharp, but it definitely paid off and it looked just like a normal day at the office for him. He didn't strain at all to win this game and good job, you know, he realised he needs to try and beat the weakest player in the tournament, if he's going to actually progress. Well, it was an incredible round. Again, we had Maxime Vachelikov absolute destroyed Ding Liren, who has now lost his first two games. I can only imagine that, you know, he's been affected by the whole environment, not just during the tournament at the moment, but in the run up to it as well. Um, we had Nepo and Grishuk drew their game. Wang Hao should have beaten Giri, but messed up and only drew. So we have four players in the lead on one and a half. We have Grishuk on one point, Giri and Alexienko on 
half and ding on zero. Incredible. We're only just at the beginning. There's lots more to come. Thanks for watching.